new descriptor. Hi, uh, I'm Pia, and I work as a chapter lead at Spotify in the infrastructure and operations tribe. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the journey that I did together with the continuous delivery team at Spotify uh, when we tried to increase productivity. Uh, I chose to call this talk Knowing Me, Knowing You, because it's about the journey that we did uh, combining the lean practices, uh, lean and XB practices, together with focusing on the team as the key component in order to increase producti productivity in a team. So just a quick recap of, of what flow means in lean. Uh, how many of you have worked with lean in your daily work? Yeah. Nearly everyone. Great. So this will go really quick. Uh, there are just a few concepts that are necessary for this talk. Um, flow in Lean is often visualized as this scrum board-like thing that we use in our industry. And uh, it's all about getting the throughput uh, of the tasks that we're doing, so the stories or tic tickets that we're working on. The throughput are like from backlog to done, increasing that speed. So in Lean, we'll often talk about WIP limits, as you know, work in progress, try to decrease the number of tasks that we are doing, working on simultaneously, and um, finding the bottlenecks of the system. And the system is not only the tech system, but actually the system of people and functions that collaborate in order to get those things to done. So we try to find those bottlenecks and remove them so we can increase the flow of work. So the back-end uh, continuous delivery team at Spotify, we, we're doing a lot of things great. But of course, we're a little bit geeky about flow, so we wanted to go faster. And this scrum board looked a little bit like, like us. We were doing a lot of things, but we didn't get as many things to done. We noticed that we had silos of knowledge in the team. Um, that was because people had moved around, and that's very common in, at Spotify, that new teams emerge and people move around quite a lot. So for certain features, we needed some key persons to review or validate the code, and we had to wait for that, so stuff wasn't moving to done uh, super fast. So we, we knew we had some bottlenecks. We wanted to improve, so what did we do? We turned to our lean and agile, practices uh, that we know increase flow of work. And here's a graph I did to show you what we did and what, what, uh, where we ended up. We started to introduce WIP limits to our flow. And yes, that increased our flow of work. So we were getting more stuff done. But as you can see, kind of, it, it increased friction as well, because our engineers, they couldn't just take another new and shiny task and work on it, but actually had to go find that key person to get that review done on the task that was already rolling to get that to done. So that wasn't as fun as before, so a tiny bit of friction there. And then we introduced test-driven development and domain-driven design. So we had sessions about uh, what test-driven development is, why, why it makes sense to do test first. Uh, we had hack days where we practiced this, uh, and we had a lot of tech discussions, architectural, big-time big discussions, uh, bringing in the DDD concepts. So we had first teaching sessions on DDD, and then, for example, architectural discussions um, talking about where do the boundaries go on a microservice using the DDD concept of bounded context? Super interesting. But, you know, increased friction as well. Um, and finally, we started doing pairing and mob programming as a default. Uh, so we even had it in our working agreements for the squad. Like, you are expected to do pairing and mobbing uh, most of the time, actually. And of course, this was also an effort to decrease the silos of knowledge that we had noted existed in the team. So everyone was sort of on board. We were doing this together. But still, we, we ended up here. We did increase the flow of our stories. We did 
get more things to done. But also, too much friction wasn't as fun any longer working in our team. So we figured we needed to find some other practices to combine with these to go down the green line. And that's what this talk is about, what we did in order to go down the green line. So I just wanted to say that these bumps that you see on the chart is what are those really in real life? So I call them blockers of a flow. And I'm going to go through four, and I'm sure there were many more, but I've collected four that I will go through and what we did about them. So, what do these blockers of flow sound like? I've collected four quotes from us uh, that you will hear, and the first one is this. That's like the first bump there. I can't do brainstorming because I haven't had time to think on my own first. We realized we needed to get the talking going. We needed to create a safe place where people could share their opinion without bothering about being right all the time. So we read up on the Google project called Aristotle. I'm sure you, many of you have read it, where they coined the phrase psychological safety. And they say that psychological safety is one of the key factors in order to build an effective team. The way they define psychological safety is how confident I am that I won't be uh, blamed or, or laughed at if I, have, if I admit a mistake or ask a question or something like that. So that's how they define it. So what did we do? Two things. First, we invented something called code creme brulee, because we thought we were a little bit like a creme brulee. Hard on the surface and soft on the inside. So um, we set out to crash that surface once per person and week, at least. Uh, what we did was ask the stupid questions, sort of the stupid questions, and uh, speak up about the task, how it makes you feel, uh, or interject in a technical argument or discussion, like, can you please go summarize this uh, discussion? I'm not really following. Trying to be a little bit vulnerable, and that helped a lot. The second thing we did was a training called Toxic Communications. This is based on the studies uh, from Dr. Gottman. Uh, he has studied married couples for 40 years, and he concluded that there are four toxic communication patterns that one should avoid in a relationship and, of course, in teams. Uh, and those are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. And, of course, he has antidotes to these patterns, and those were the ones we practiced. So what we did was we, for example, introduced the I message. Maybe some of you have heard about that. <clears throat> These are, this is no news, but it was great to practice. So the I message is basically just saying, instead of saying, this sucks, one could say, I think this sucks, which is less offensive. <laughs> uh, defensiveness is all about taking responsibility for your actions instead of putting the blame on some other squad. And contempt, which according to Gottman is the most critical one, is often seen in teams and relationships as sarcasm, and that needs to stop too. Uh, so according to him, an antidote is uh, appreciations. So we introduced appreciations uh, every now and then in our retros. So, this helped. This actually helped. We started to go down the green line. But then we started to hear this other thing. I'm interrupted all the time. We realized we needed to practice how to listen and listen actively. We did uh, one technique, which is this one, and then one rule. 
So this technique, yes, Anne, how many of you have worked with this? Yeah, many people, great. So yes, and comes from the improv theater. Uh, it is about building on others' ideas. Uh, and you're not, never supposed to say no or yes, but. Because if you say yes, but, the listener hears it as a no. So it would go something like this. This unit test does too many things. I'm going to delete it. Yes, and let's pair up and write some clear tests for that method instead. And one important thought about the yes and is that it's about hearing that third uh, opinion that is never, or idea, that is never heard if you answer yes, but the first time. And then we introduce this rule. It's called wait your turn. We have a lot of passionate people at Spotify and uh, very sometimes heated and passionate discussions about architecture and cool stuff. And we, we talked about it's not great to be interrupted all the time, so everyone could agree uh, we should just stop doing that, and after speaking up about it, it quickly went away. So here we are, getting ourselves down the green line. These two um, sort of practices helped us collaborate more uh, with each other. But we ha heard this third quote. We think so differently. It's just better we don't pair together. So we needed to find ways, learn ways, how to give feedback without blaming. We needed to learn how to give friendly feedback. And Spotify is very big on feedback, uh, and I hear other companies as well. So one of the formats of feedback that is uh, taught on the Spotify leadership camp is this one, which we practiced. It's called the nonviolent communication format, uh, and uh, sometimes called transparency model. So it's this author called Marshall Rosenberg, who wrote a book in the 70s called no Nonviolent Communication, uh, and started that movement. Um, and he, he says that a conflict is a tragic expression of an unmet need. And, and basically nothing else. Only a tragic expression of an unmet need. So it would go something like this. First, you express the observation, the, describe the action. So, when you merged to master yesterday, I felt, so the second line, confused. And then you go to the need of mine. Because I have a need to know bigger architectural changes since I'm on call. And then you go to the request. Next time, would you consider to get me in the loop before you merge a bigger change like that to master. And the trick really is with nonviolent communication to never focus on the interpretation of what someone says, all my thoughts about what someone says, but actually only keep to my needs that are unmet in that situation. And according to Marshall Rosenberg, that's how we stay away from the blame game. So we, we practice this. This is not easy. It looks easy, but it's not easy. Um, OK, and then we did this format. Turn up the good. Have you heard about this? Anyone? One person. Cool. Uh, so this comes from the positive psychology field. Um, researchers uh, like Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, who wrote the book Love 2.0 and popularized this, uh, in, like, um, this field, positive psychology, says that we're far more likely to improve our ways of working if we focus on what we're doing great and turn up that, turn that up, instead of focusing on finding faults. So this format is super simple. Uh, we use it in uh, retros and sometimes on one-on-ones. Uh, and it's about like, 
We gather everyone, you know the retro format. Uh, instead of saying what everything that isn't working, we, we say we focus on everything that is working. So uh, we put that as stickies on the board instead. And then we categorize that, and then we choose the most important thing that is really working well, and decide one action. How can we turn this up one notch? And after one of those retros, we reflected in the team. Did we miss out on talking about things that are really important, maybe incidents, because we use this format? And we realized that we didn't actually lose out on anything, because we just phrased it in a more positive way. But we did talk about all the important things. Uh, and we left the retros feeling more energized, which hadn't really been the case before. <clears throat> so, nonviolent communication and turn up the good format really help to get that feedback loop running. And as uh, previous speakers have been talking about feedback, it's very important in order to improve. Of course, you all know that. And we're talking about the system, not only the PRs, but actually the people giving each other feedback, because the people are the system in Lean to get that flow of work. And I believe that the fourth and the last quote here is coming from having done all of these three. Uh, it opened up for this fourth quote. I'm not sure about the purpose of this team or what I'm doing here. We needed to answer why. So when a team is moving really fast, it starts to become really important to know exactly where we're going and why. We did, we took use from, um, we used Google Format, uh, which I'm sure you have heard a lot about, objectives and key results. Uh, and then we did a fun exercise from, from the UX world that I will share. So objectives and key results uh, can really help if they're used properly, I think. Uh, we, we are on this journey still, haven't figured everything out, but I'm going to share just a few quick uh, realizations that we have had. So, in the continuous delivery backend team, we were, we were having this, these objectives that were solution-driven in the beginning. Uh, wasn't really inspiring and felt like a top-down thing. So, we realized we were doing it wrong, and then we started to realize that, okay, the objectives need to be really inspirational. Everyone should be able to understand them and get behind them, sort of. So we chose uh, the last objective that we had was um, centralize all continuous integration at Spotify. And that's inspiring for a CD team. Um, and then the KRs are supposed to be measurements of how far along we are to reaching that objective. So they, must, they mustn't uh, have any solutions in them. So, for example, our, one of our last KRs for this objective was increase customer base on our CD platform with 60%. So there's no mentioning of how to increase, uh, find all these customers among these 150 teams that are using a, this, this platform. But that's left up to the team to figure out the use cases that we could implement which would serve these 60% of customers. And then we did this thing, which is called Despicable Design. Um, <clears throat> this comes from the UX world. And we used this exercise in order to answer why we as a team existed uh, from our user's perspective. So we started out by um, defining the worst possible user experience that we could possibly provide our users this, in the system that we offered. So what could make our product truly evil and a horrific user experience? So we said like, oh, we had tons of uh, examples of how we could make stuff worse. Uh, so much slower response times, service windows midday, uh, postal reviews, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. 
we were thinking about our users. And this was a nice break, because we were usually thinking about our stakeholders, our deadlines, our KRs, our stories, what the PMs would say. But now we were thinking about our users and helping them define why we existed as a team. And of course, then we categorized all these horrific experiences and figured out stuff that we could improve in each of these areas. Uh, so it left us feeling strengthened in understanding why our customers wanted us to be there. And here we are. This is my last slide. Uh, so combining all of these practices, it helped us to get to a much better place uh, in that team. And we shipped that CD platform to our users. We, don't, we didn't reach the 60% of, of customers yet, uh, but we're on our way. So this really helped us to go down the green line. Uh, but we also noticed that this thing's having an effective team, it's not static at all. So it's not like uh, do it once and then you're done. People move around quite a lot at Spotify. And when that happens, uh, we sort of start from the beginning, or wherever we start, somewhere. So engineers and leads constantly need to have an eye on these things. I believe that paying attention to the people on the team would actually help us get much more fast. And I hope these practices help your teams to uh, ship faster and be happier. Thank you.